dealt with this in a few videos in part, but we keep hearing many discuss alternative theories uh, that we'll go ahead and vet now. Let's do this. Uh, we know that Nephilim giants are there before, during the flood, right? And then what? Well, we know they're there leading up to it. Then, wait a minute, we also know they're there after the flood. So wait a minute, how did this happen? And this is where we see uh, alternative theories, like uh, was there a second fallen angel incursion where another group of angels fell because the watchers are locked away, so it couldn't be them, right? So did another group of angels fall? Uh, and where's that in scripture? Mm, that's a pretty big event. Remember that. Uh, and then would have, you know, fallen uh, and mated with human women again. Did that happen? We'll talk about that. Uh, then what about the bloodlines of the wives of the patriarchs? Did some Nephilim slip in there? Uh, especially the wives of Noah's three sons. Now that's what's assumed is that's where it happened because they know that Noah was pure in his generations according to Genesis. But see, what they're not doing is they're not reading the record of the wives of the patriarchs. We will. Uh, or did a spaceship come down and take them away? Ooh, yeah, that sounds really logical. Hmm, uh, you probably know the answer to that one. Or did Nephilim learn that Noah had built an ark to survive the coming deluge uh, and then copy that? Hmm, wait a minute. There we know of something that makes some sense. Because, well, they knew Noah was going to survive the flood, and they knew that was going to work. See, they already knew it was going to work. So probably that would be a good thing to land on, right? Uh, well, I'm just using a little logic there. I know. Don't, don't you dare do that, right? Okay, but let's see what Scripture actually says and what it doesn't. And we will clear this up once and for all in this video. Done. There is only one of these that's even plausible, actually, and the rest fail quickly. Let's test them. By the way, some think the pyramids, because we show that on the cover for good reason, uh, were built before the flood. And of course, we say, hint, no, not these, right? This is because our modern Genesis has been manipulated and changed, removing about 100 years from multiple births uh, of the patriarchs after the flood. Uh, one dude, in fact, is missing completely from our modern Genesis. Where did he go? Because he's there in Luke. Oops, what? Wait a minute. You mean Luke says in the genealogy of Yahusha, there's a dude that's missing from Genesis? That's a problem for Genesis, is it not? Well, yeah, it is when Jubilees, the ancient Greek Septuagint Genesis, and even the Samaritan Pentateuch actually record the dude uh, along with Luke. So Luke is accurate. Genesis is wrong. It's been changed. And um, that affects the timeline. Uh, and we've corrected that uh, as we cover it in who changed Genesis. There's about 700 or so years missing. And that's why when you look at the Jewish calendar in there, it's year 5,700 and yeah, you don't know because you've changed the Bible and you've screwed it up and you're missing at least 700 years. So your, your calendar's off anyway because you follow the moon, which is, is wrong. And we cover that too. And uh, when does the Bible day begin? But anyway, no, the pyramids in Egypt anyway were built after the flood. That's why you don't find any marine fossils on top of them. Hmm. That's a good question that some have asked and they use it to say, see, the Bible's wrong. Well, that's because it's been changed and the timeline's off, but the pyramids were built after the flood. Uh, not that we would know necessarily since, uh, of course, to complicate that whole thing more, you know what they did with the pyramids? They actually removed the facing, oddly. Uh, and then they put it on different buildings uh, throughout Egypt, uh, used them for building. Mm, kind of weird. Uh, great way to cover it up. If, in fact, there were marine fossils there, there wouldn't be any more. Uh, you know, they, it, it's an occult area. What do you expect? It's going to try, they're going to try 
to uh, mess everything up in any way they can. They certainly could not have survived the flood, the Nephilim, with a snorkel or even scuba gear. That's why we put that there. It's kind of cute. But it was a year-long event. So, no, just, no, that would be a pretty big tank. <laughs> and snorkel, yeah, that wouldn't work. Uh, and then uh, spaceships, well, we're going to deal with that a little further as well. Uh, let's get started. We start with Genesis 6. Yes, Genesis 6 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Daughters of men, got that? Not daughters of Elohim, understand? Get that? That's important to understand the terminology. That the sons of Elohim, wait a minute, that's different. The term is different. It's not sons of sons. Mm. It's not sons of men. It's sons of what? Elohim? Well, in Hebrew, that's a very specific Hebrew phrase, b'nei ha Elohim, only used four times, which we've covered in detail, especially in uh, who were the Nephilim. Watch it. Uh, it's only used four times, uh, such as in Job. And it refers to the very council of Elohim angels, in fact. Absolutely, 100%. It's nothing else. There are they are always angels. That's it. That's all that phrase refers to, period. No one can confuse the term uh, with the English translation, sons of God, which you see other times. But see, the thing is, it's a different phrase, and it's, it's the different context, not the same thing. Only four times is this used. So they saw the sons of Elohim saw what? Saw the daughters of men, not the daughters of Elohim. Hello. Okay. So obviously there's something different to this dynamic because something monumental happens. They bore giants. That's a pretty big thing to overlook for any scholar. Yet they do. Uh, that they were fair. They were beautiful, not white. And that's one of the most ridiculous things we've ever heard. The word fair in Old English is a reference to one being beautiful, not white. Uh, that's a newer use of the term in English. And they took them wives of all they chose, which they chose. Okay, so more than one, it appears. Uh, and likely, I mean, we're talking about populating the earth with, you know, not just thousands, millions, maybe even billions of this hybrid being, mixture of angel and human women. Hmm which is not supposed to be. Angels are not supposed to procreate, according to Scripture. Uh, humans are supposed to reproduce after their kind, according to Scripture. So this is breaking the law of creation. And Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. Notice, he responded. This is a huge thing to him. This matters to him. Uh, is so much so that he had to recreate, he had to replenish the entire earth. Okay, so for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Now some try to also say, and many of the same or or you know have these alternative theories, which are are we're gonna deal with. Uh, we cover this in our video, Are Man's Days Limited to 120 Years uh, in Answers in Jubilees? Uh, Noah did not take 120 years to build the ark. We have that timeline. It's there in Jubilees. And actually, you can even get it out of Genesis. And it doesn't work. Uh, it wasn't 120 years to build the ark. The 120 years is the lifespan of man. And Jubilees comes right out and says exactly that. You really can't miss it. The Bible never says otherwise. And science tells you it's actually come true. <laughs> Hardly anybody has ever lived beyond 120 years, and even those that have have only lived 122, 124. I mean, there's just no one's living beyond 120 years anymore. Yeah, they did initially after the flood. That's true. It took generations for this to happen. You did something in the DNA of man that caused us to lose years. 
Uh, you know anybody that's 120 today? There's not, I think, maybe two on earth. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's rare. Now, again, the Bible says exactly that and never says otherwise. Watch that video, though, and you'll see for yourself. Do we prove it? We believe we do. Verse 4, and this is the key. There were giants in the earth. Are we sure they're giants? Was that interpreted correctly? Uh, larger than normal humans isn't giant? Yeah, absolutely, we are. 100%, by the way, because there are many confirmations of this throughout inspired scripture. We'll show you some. Uh, watch Who Were the Nephilim, and we have a whole video on that. It's a very well done video. You'll love it. Uh, in those days, what days? The days of the flood. That's what's being talked about in the account. So that's those days. Understand that. And, wait a minute, and what? The giants also after that. After the flood. Hmm. The Nephilim. That's the word. The Nephilim were there before the flood, and the Nephilim were there after the flood, according to Genesis 6, 4. It's telling you they survive the flood in bloodline somehow. It doesn't tell you how, but does it need to? Not really. Now, we can put all this together, and we will in this video. So it really kind of says it all right there. Genesis 6, 4 says giants will survive the flood. Now, how does that work? Well, let's test this. Let's make sure that that makes sense. When the B'nai Ha Elohim came in unto the daughters of men, not Elohim, mm, it's a different union going on there. It's just like Daniel 2.43. They will mingle their seed with the seed of men. They aren't men if they mingle their seed with men. Duh. Pretty easy to read. That's what Daniel's always said. And he tells you how to interpret the feet of miry clay himself. He tells you how to read that. Not We don't need a theologian to tell us. And they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Now, who are the ancient ones of renown? Well, they're the giants, especially the titans, the ten giant kings of Atlantis. I mean, we know these stories. Yes, they come through the Nephilim, uh, Greek mythology. Yes, that's a Nephilim perspective, but we know that that's there. So not a surprise. You think Moses didn't know that, especially being in Egypt? Of course he did. When he says renown, he means he knew about it. They're the giants, the Nephilim the, from the occult. They're the gods of the occult. The demigods, especially. These were destroying the earth. It is not a good renown. Understand that. And Moses knew this. Uh, they are the mighty men. Okay. Uh, so all those things are pretty clear. Uh, are we sure they're giant in size, though? Well, we have confirmation of that. So we know that, yes, that's true. And Elohim saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart get this, look at this language, was only, they didn't think about anything else, evil continually. What? Okay, only evil continually? Wow, now, you don't get more evil than that? Incapable of even having one pure thought. Think about that. Absolute pure evil. Wow. These Nephilim, or Nephil, singular, uh, Nephilim is plural. When you add an I am in Hebrew, it's, it's like adding an S in English. Uh, they're giants. All three times the word is used in the KJV. Notice it's only used three times. And this is critical. You'll see. Are we sure, though, uh, that they're really giant in size? Again, 100%. We'll show you. That's not in question. Uh, any any scholar that questions that, it's okay for them to question, but the fact that they can't do the research and find the answer, which is easy to find, is, is very illiterate. Uh, we'll show you. This originates in the Hebrew word nafal, meaning fall or fallen ones, essentially, as many uh, have characterized. See, this is a race that they, they just should not exist, right? They're pure evil. They should not be. All human races are Yahuwah's. 
And there is no actual true difference between our races. There's no difference between white, black, uh, red, if you will, yellow, if you will, or whatever color you want to put to the skin tone. They're just different tones of melanin. Really doesn't even matter when you think about it. Yahuwah created all of them. However, there is only one human race, and the enemy loves to divide us with divisive language. Uh, you know, he has us at each other's throats over race when there's a fraction of a percent difference in our DNA even. We are one race, one people. However, the true racist of all time are really the Nephilim who view us as ants. I mean, you want to talk about communism. <laughs> wow, that is a Nephilim doctrine. You still find that thinking in the elite, such as, well, Bill Gates, uh, who actually went on TED Talks and in an interview uh, that he wants to reduce world population. He thinks that's a good thing. And he even admitted, yeah, we can do that by about 15%. Through vaccinations. Oh, great there, Mr. Gates. You just said you're going to kill people. You murderer. You idiot. Who do you think you are? But let's play along. Here you go, Mr. Gates. You first. Come on, let's reduce world population. You first. Why does he think like a Nephilim? Ah, that's the real problem. And you can follow that doctrine, whether he has their bloodlines or not, though likely. Uh, it doesn't matter. He at least espouses their doctrines, their cult doctrines. I mean, it's a complete lack of faith to think that the world is overpopulated and that Yahuwah would not have created uh, a world sufficient for us. Will there be problems? Uh, read Revelation. Yes, there will in the end times. There's no doubt about that. Do we cry and scream and jump up and down every time we see something like a drought or a storm or, you know, this or that? You know, because the Bible says that they'll increase in the last days? No, no. There are some things that we should pay attention to, like volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, because this is Yahuwah speaking through these things. Um, but do we look at every storm and say, ah, oh, see, we're in, the, we're in the very last days. We must be in the Great Tribulation because there was hail. Yeah, the hail in Revelation uh, uh, in the six vials, the six bowls, is 60 pounds. So you produce me a video that shows 60 pound hail and I'll, I'll jump on that bandwagon, no problem. But until that happens, uh, enough of the nonsense. It just doesn't work. Uh, so anyway, let's move on. When you break down the three uses of this word in the fall, uh, interpreted accurately as giants. One is in Genesis 6, 4, we just saw. But then, and this is telling, and this really pulls it all together. It's just right here. Done. I mean, it, the case is done right here. This is the same word, nephal, nephilim, plural, used in Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw nephilim giants. The sons of Anak. We even know how to connect that. Come on, guys. The Anunnaki are the famous Sumerian gods who were fallen angels and demigods, Nephilim, their progeny. Uh, just as the Greek, the Babylonian, the Egyptian, even Indian, even China. I mean, you see these throughout the world in different occult cultures. Uh, so are we sure, though? that uh, Genesis 6, 4 uh, it really means the same? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Are, are we sure they're, they're giants in size? 100%. Look at this. Genesis continues. These sons of Anak, the Anunnaki, which come of the giants, Nephilim. There it is right there. Hello. Anyone saying there were no giants is not representing scripture, number one. How big were these Nephilim giants in numbers after the flood? Well, they're smaller than they were before the flood. The worst were wiped out. The Titans were wiped out. Because Nephilim, though, 
and this is just the rule. I don't know why, but probably because when angels take human form throughout Scripture, they're always male. Notice that. Always male, never female. So there must be something about the genetic makeup of a Nephilim that then they had to take human women as wives, and that is recorded in many of their uh, legends. So basically, um, they become smaller with each generation as their uh, their DNA becomes more and more human. And today, I mean, we don't see giants anymore. Not really. I mean, I, tall people, but don't go to the Nephilim every time you see a tall basketball player. That's ridiculous. Nonsense. That's never been logic. Genesis 6-4 is now understood. See, when you see that these post-flood giants are not a new breed. They do not descend from a new fallen angel incursion, says Numbers. It's right there. Come on, the language is clear. They originate from the Nephilim giants from before the flood, specifically from Genesis 6, 4, from the union of the sons of Elohim and daughters of men, specifically and exclusively, period. So they are the same bloodline and they can't be a new one, period. They crossed the flood, but, but how did they do that? Genesis 6-4 already tells you, especially with numbers, a few giants survived the flood. It's right there in the language too. Uh, can we know this though? Yes, and we can firmly. Uh, we'll put this together for good in this video. Scholars who are really scoffers, let's just be honest, uh, have no clue what scholarship or research is uh, when they claim that there, there weren't any giants. You get that from Judaism. Understand that. Many rabbis teach that stupidity. They don't know what they're talking about. Understand they don't speak ancient Hebrew and they don't know it. And they do not represent Torah. They speak Yiddish, which is infused with other languages and is not Hebrew. So, uh, and they do not follow Torah. They follow the Talmud and its interpretation, which Yahusha made very clear, has leaven and turns Torah against Torah, Mark 7, 9. We should already know this as they are the continuation of the Pharisees whose bloodlines actually include Nephilim. Oh, how about that? Uh, for some say, not all Jews, no, but some at the top have tried to preserve their Nephilim bloodlines. Uh, I mean, that's what Genesis says, especially in Greek, and we've covered that. Watch who is a sh Hashem, for one. Um, we have covered Gog of Magog and several other videos here. Psalm 83, War, uh, the True Biblical Israel. We have tons of videos on that topic. However, yes, they were giants in size, indeed. How do we know? Well, here's Sirach. Now, the wisdom of Sirach is in what they call Apocrypha. What, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. That's Greek. Forget Greek, okay? We're speaking English here. What does it mean? Hidden away. So the wisdom of Sirach has been hidden away. Understand that. It was in your 1611 KJV. Oops. What? Yeah, it was. It was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many fragments. And it's quoted in the Dead Sea Scrolls by the temple priests, the original true temple priests, the sons of Zadok, who were not Essenes, which is one of the dumbest things we've ever heard. So Sirach 16.7 uh, even mentions the old giants from before the flood. And then you have Baruch also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, chapter 6 of it especially. Uh, Baruch 3.26 quotes Genesis 6 basically. Uh, and would you look at that? A Hebrew scribe, that's what Baruch was, and prophet, because he became one, actually knew how to read the Hebrew. Maybe we should go to him to find out in ancient times how the ancient scribe, who is an expert in Hebrew, read Hebrew. Wow! How about that instead of going to a stupid rabbi that speaks Yiddish and doesn't even know what Hebrew is? They're liars and hypocrites, said Yahusha. Why have we forgotten that? Famous from the beginning that were of 
So great stature, says Baruch. Hello. Stature is size. So they were huge. They were giant in size. Yes, that's true. They were giants indeed. Uh, and so expert in war. That's also a well-documented fact, even in Genesis. But you read Jubilees, you read Enoch, first Enoch. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the level of warfare. Uh, they were destroying the world. They were. Uh, and uh, they were destroyed because they had no wisdom. They were pure evil in every thought. Even their imagination of every thought in their heart was evil continually. They, they didn't even have room for a conscious good thought. That's pretty bad. And they perished through their own foolishness. Oh, but wait a minute. Does that mean, because that's used also in Genesis, if you pull out just a fragment and don't read the context, which qualifies, I don't know why many do that, but they do. Uh, so does it actually mean that a few giants could not have survived the flood? Well, Genesis 6-4 told us they did already. So then it says later that all perished that were on the face of the earth. Well, we'll cover that. Uh, Genesis says they perished too, but... It also qualifies itself, and it says some survived, especially, oh, wait a minute, it also says all of the humans perished. But wait, wasn't Noah human? Well, yeah, he was. Now, we know the Bible says very clearly in Genesis that Noah survived the flood. He, his wife, his sons, their wives, and uh, all that was on the ark, right? Oh, but wait a minute, that fragment out of context doesn't say that it says all perished oops well learn how to read because you don't read that way you read the whole passage the whole chapter and when there's a qualify there in one verse you don't then read another verse and forget that it was there that's ridiculous it's not reading it's illiteracy well baruch certainly does not say that and genesis says otherwise there you go are there other witnesses to this account? Several, actually. And that's the amazing thing that, I mean, these are the ancient witnesses. And when you test them, many of them test as inspired scripture. Now, we're going through that process right now. We've been publishing some of these books. Uh, and uh, I think we found so far something like 13 uh, books that test as inspired scripture that were in the original bible canon of the actual temple priests who were ordained by moses to keep scripture there's nobody else to follow but watch our original canon series for that in fact though even the local writings in the dead sea scrolls confirm this is the way you read genesis see there's so many witnesses to this you know, 2 Peter 3 warned us that these would be the tactics of the enemy in our age, the last days, that we would deny creation, deny the flood, and deny the deity of Messiah. And this is under attack in the church. The modern church generally does not believe the flood account, the creation account, as they are written, nor can they even read it, it seems. Not that it would be a surprise because they just trash the whole Old Testament largely, like, uh, you know, John MacArthur, who we've covered. Uh, but there's many examples of that, and most denominations uh, within their doctrines, they, they just, they're haters of the Old Testament, the law, uh, the ways of Yahuwah. They try to paint a different religion under Yahusha, but that's a real problem. He could not be bringing a different religion. When he didn't do anything, he didn't see the Father do. Do we even know what he said? I mean, obviously, many do not. And we've proven that, unfortunately, too many times. But Wisdom of Solomon 14.6 also speaks of the Nephilim and the old tie. Uh, also, uh, when the proud giants perished, right? All of them? Every single one? That doesn't have to be the case. Uh, again, the same language is used of man, yet... Noah survived and those with him. So uh, some try to seize on the language. But if they interpret that way, uh, again, then Noah also perished. So what do you do then? I mean, you know, so you've undermined all of Scripture because you want to you hold to 
a position that has never made any sense. Genesis 6, 4 qualifies. A few Nephilim did cross over the flood. It leaves room for that for a reason, because they did. Because their bloodline is still there in numbers. Their bloodline that descends specifically from the Nephilim of Genesis 6, 4. Because it's not anywhere else in Scripture. Hello. That word is only in Genesis 6, 4 and in Numbers 13, 33. It's only there three times. Once in Genesis, twice in Numbers in that single passage. So it, why? Why, why do that? Simple. The Bible's brilliant. And the Bible pulls these things together in a way that you really can't even question them. Not if you're really reading it and if you want to know the truth. You simply can't miss that. Now, when we go to Jubilees, uh, we really get clarity on this. It is the second witness written by Moses, We Prove. Now, we've published this book, and it's available free in ebook on bookofjubilees.org. Go read it. Go read the test. We have a giant Torah test in there. If you haven't reviewed it, don't pretend to know the book. Uh, certainly don't pretend to have an opinion on whether or not it's scripture because you don't know, you haven't researched it. Those that have, have a tough time standing against it. Um, are there corruptions in the text? Uh, you know, a couple places? Yes, there are, just as there are in Genesis. Hello. So that shouldn't be surprised to anybody either. And to seize on those kinds of things and try to use it to undermine the whole text, that's not scholarship. That's, that's, that is that's a, a whole paradigm of stupid that also undermines all of Scripture when they do it because the same criteria they're using, they're not applying to Genesis. And they better, or they're liars. They're inconsistent liars. They're not honest men. And that's a problem. We have too many dishonest men in scholarship today. Jubilees 5.10, and we cover this far deeper in our video titled, Who Were the Nephilim? And there, the Nephilim, fathers, the watchers, fallen angels, who took human women for wives, right? I mean, that's very clear in Jubilees, especially, First Enoch and in Genesis, were witnesses of their destruction. Of course, that's in parentheses, it's been added, but that's okay. Uh, and after this, they were bound in the depths of the earth forever until the day of the great condemnation when judgment is executed on all those who have corrupted their ways and their works before Yahuwah. Jubilees is extremely clear on this, uh, probably even more than Enoch, though Enoch has more content. Uh, and it also is very clear, but Jubilees really is dynamic uh, in this regard. The Bible's clear that judgment does not happen at death for any of us. doesn't happen. Uh, it happens in the future on the day of judgment and not before. Now, generally, and that goes for Nephilim, uh, they're locked away, they're in prison, just like when, you know, you're incarcerated, uh, you go to prison and you await trial, right? But then you have a trial and then, then you go through judgment. It's the same. Uh, judgment doesn't occur, that judgment, that level of judgment doesn't occur until the day of judgment for any of us. Now, generally, as we cover in Answers in First Enoch, the Watchers are never released from their prison. Watch 70 Generations, and we explain that. Um, they are judged there and perish there. Notice the tense here is future, and the next sentences continue in the same sense, in the same tense, in fact, according to uh, R.H. Charles in his margin note, which we'll share with you. These next verses, 11 and 12, should read, He shall destroy. See, the tense is off, according to R.H. Charles. Uh, and there shall be not one left, or left one of them. And then, he shall make. All in the future tense. And see, it's the same with Genesis. They're there in those days, and also after that. See? This is the same in Genesis 6, 4, in the days of the flood, and also after that, after the flood. Pretty simple. Two major witnesses, Genesis and Jubilees, tell us Nephilim crossed the flood. And even though they were destroyed, as was all flesh, with the breath of life, there's a qualifier. 
It is, in fact, not 100%, just as it isn't 100% with man. I mean, it's, it's like, let's say there was a battle, right? And let's say there were 10,000 soldiers on the losing side. And of those 10,000, uh, 99.9999999% percent of them all perished, all died. And then someone says they perished. You know, whoever that enemy is, the Greeks, okay, whoever they were. The Greeks perished. Well, yeah, they perished. The ones that were in the battle perished. But wait a minute, a few survived. Does it make the statement false? No, of course not. We don't read that way. We don't look at anything that way. But some try to look at the Bible in this passage and they try to do this to force strange doctrine. That's a problem. Here's one of the biggest qualifiers in Genesis 2-7. Adam received the breath of life, right? What was that? His spirit from Yahuwah. He wasn't alive until he had a spirit residing in his physical body. Now, in Genesis 7-15, Noah and all in the ark had the breath of life, or Yahuwah's spirit that he made for them. Now, Nephilim, however, do not have a spirit that Yahuwah made in this sense. He didn't create them. They're demons. He didn't create demons. So they do not have the breath of life. They are not a creation. And Yahuwah didn't create spirits for them. That's why their spirits can't go into uh, the places they're supposed to within the earth. If they were human, they have to crawl the dry places and they become disembodied spirits, the origin of demons. Now, we explain that in From Where Do Demons Originate? A very good video. An abomination that should not exist yet, um, yet it does, of course, uh, because fallen angels chose to sin with human women, defying the law of creation. One, angels are not to have children. Two, they don't in heaven. And Yahushua said that, and that's still true. That doesn't change anything. Uh, they weren't in heaven, and they were in physical form. They could do everything a man could do. Uh, so, and number three, humans and animals are to reproduce after their kinds keeping their orders of creation. Angels don't procreate at all. They're not supposed to have children. So there you go. Then notice in Genesis 6, 17 and 7, 22, this is key. It repeats that all with the breath of life on earth, all with the breath of life, Yahuwah's spirit, on earth, not marine life, on land, okay, shall die in one passage and of course in the other it says that they did in fact die those with the breath of life well that's not nephilim they, they don't have the breath of life see noah was not on dry land therefore this isn't saying noah died right and we know he didn't so it couldn't say it anyway so anybody that reads it that way really isn't reading right i mean that, that's a comprehension level that is not even elementary now, the same goes for the Nephilim who were on their own ark that they copied from Noah. They were floating at sea. They weren't on land. And they don't have the breath of life anyway. So they're not being mentioned in that passage. Yet that's being used by many to say, oh, well, that couldn't be. The Nephilim could not have survived the flood. No, the Bible says they did, period. They, you can't really question that at all. First Enoch 7-2 spends chapters on this, and we cover that in Answers in First Enoch in great detail. And read the book, firstenoch.org, free and ebook. You can download it. Uh, it's also available in print if you want. Were they giants? I mean, much larger than humans? Let's get back to that. Well, indeed, they were. They were great, meaning large. And their height was even recorded as three as much as 3,000 elves. Now, no, not the European L. You don't calculate that and end up with hundreds of feet tall. That's ridiculous. We have no way to determine just how large this is, really, because we don't know what an L was before the flood. We just don't know. The, the, like with a cubit. We know that the, the cubit 
When you look backwards, there's an angelic cubit, there's a Babylonian cubit, there's an Egyptian cubit. You know, the cubit has transformed, and you really have to read the passage and see what age you're even talking about to see what cubit measure is even being related. Same thing. And that's the same with the Ark, by the way, which Ron Wyatt got wrong. He uses the Egyptian cubit, which is far too late, when he has the Babylonian cubit and the actual Bible cubit of an angel. Uh, yeah, no. And so his Ark is the wrong size. Uh, and even the guys over at uh, Answers in Genesis get that. So it's clear here they're very large, no doubt, uh, much larger than humans. These giants first consumed everything men could bring them to eat. Then they were no longer satisfied by that, and they turned against mankind, even eating them. And that's confirmed in Jubilees too, by the way. Yes, you do not want the return of what they call the Golden Age of Atlantis. Atlantis was ruled by the ten giant kings uh, who, who came from Poseidon, a fallen angel. They were Nephilim. That's not a Golden Age for humans, uh, unless you like you know, being consumed uh, and eaten like a chicken. If you enjoy that, go ahead. So they were giants. They were devouring mankind, which also shows that they obviously had super strength and, and were much larger. I mean, the whole paradigm of Marvel Comics and DC Comics, guys, that is Nephilim. I mean, even Superman is the sun god. He's powered by the sun, literally. I mean, they, they just put that in there. Uh, one, of the, one of the latest ones they did, uh, I think it was called the Eternals. And they go back and they use the Sumerian characters like Gilgamesh, who was a Nephilim. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just amazing that they, they have no creativity whatsoever. And they're actually showing you that all along, all they've been doing is retelling the story of the Nephilim, uh, you know, with capes and disguises and masks and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, if you just put on glasses, no one will ever know who you are right? <laughs> I mean, the whole notion of Superman is, is one of the craziest when you think about it. Uh, obviously, everybody would know pretty soon uh, who the guy was. I mean, they would, they would know his speech, his face, and everything. Uh, so, duh. But essentially, there may have been some cronies who served the giants, left, but generally, mankind was gone. Noah was likely one of the only ones, he and his family, uh, that had pure generations left on the entire earth. Think about that. This is far more drastic than we've been taught. And the flood in scope is far larger than any church is really teaching for the most part. There's some uh, that get it uh, right or closer. Uh, but most, they don't even understand the scope of this event. In verse 5, these Nephilim giants even turned against animals and began manipulating their DNA as well. Uh, they were devout, the, thus hybrids, right? Uh, and go look at the walls of some of the pyramids in Egypt. What are they drawing there? They're drawing hybrids that were from the pre-flood world, likely. Did some survive? Maybe. I don't know. Um, we don't have any evidence of that specifically. They were devouring them as well as even other Nephilim orders. So they were killing men, they were, they were consuming animals, uh, you know, and, and devouring even themselves. I mean, this was uh, a, just such a, a chaos that is unimaginable until the end times revelation, because as the days of Noah were, so shall it be in the second coming of the Son of Man. And that's Yahushua, by the way from Enoch. He's quoting Enoch there, not Daniel. Daniel quotes Enoch too. The earth laid accusation against these lawless ones, or sinners, men of sin, people of sin, or whatever you want to call them, uh, these beings of sin. Uh, many churches teach that we should all be lawless as well, and that's a problem for churches, because sin is defined in 1 John 3, 4, and 8 as lawlessness. So to teach lawlessness is to teach sin. And obviously, we have a law. The Bible's always had it. And let's be honest, most churches are fine with nine of the commandments. There's only one they have a problem with, and that's the Sabbath. Watch our Sabbath series. We restore that. Read Rest, the case for Sabbath. Free an ebook, restsabbath.org, and we restore that there as well. The days of Noah are returning, folks. We are marching there as a world right now 
in unison. Uh, no, not all of us. Uh, some of us uh, in the remnant are definitely not, uh, but we can see it, and it is so obvious. The difference in this age, as, as we get closer, is that there will be such a distinction between good and evil. There will be such a distinction between the ecclesia, the remnant, and those that are unbelievers. People are going to choose. They're going to get off the fence. They're going to stop playing games necessarily, though some still will, um, but they're going to choose. And in the days of the mark of the beast, they will choose, and that will define them. They're, they're choosing whether they're going to serve Yahuwah or not, period. That's it, the end. And when you take the mark of the beast, scripture's clear, you are not any longer eligible for salvation. Many Christians will take that mark. You watch. So one theory out there is that even after the watchers were locked away, uh, and there's no fallen angels at that time, all fallen angels are locked away except for uh, Gadriel, Lucifer. Uh, watch who was Gadriel, by the way. We covered that. Uh, he obviously didn't take human women for wives, uh, or he'd be judged the same. He'd face the same judgment. He had his own judgment from before for what he did in the garden when he fell. And no, he didn't exist before creation because he wasn't created yet. He was created on the first day with all the other angels. Uh, again, that's clarified. Watch Restoring Creation. We restore all of that. Uh, did angels fall like this again, though? Well, first of all, you, you know that Michael actually declared in First Enoch, we cover this, uh, at this imprisonment of the Watchers. He says, no angel will ever do that again. And he was right, of course. Uh, Michael would know. Uh, the, the punishment was so severe. And they saw it. And so angels didn't do that again. And there is nothing in Scripture. Nothing. I, you really have to stretch to even try it. And even those fail very quickly if you test them. Uh, there's nothing in Scripture that ever says there was a second incursion uh, where... Uh, there was another group of watchers who took human women as wives. Didn't happen. No. They were trying to do that in Sodom. The, the men there knew that if their daughters mated with those angels in Sodom, that they would, in fact, bring the return of the Nephilim and really even the Titans, the mega giants. Uh, and that didn't happen. Yahuwah stepped in. And that's the reason why the judgment was so severe. The largest problem with this thinking is, as good as it sounds, it's absolutely, it has zero witnesses in any scripture anywhere. See, not only would an account like this be there in scripture if it were true, uh, but it's not. Uh, there's nothing there at all. But here's what would have to accompany it. See, Yahuwah is a righteous Elohim, and he must judge this supposed second incursion the same as the first. Oh, he could choose a different punishment uh, of sort of the same magnitude. But in order to be a just Elohim, he would have to. So their judgment would be there in Scripture. That's a huge thing to be missing, and it's not there anywhere. Nowhere. No, the Council of Elohim passage, that's not even remotely not even people are misunderstanding that when they try to stretch that and that's one and you need two witnesses where where do you have no you got nothing this is because it never happened it's not in scripture angels did not fall in this manner again and again scripture is clear the bloodline of nephilim continued through the flood it crossed the flood they survived the flood period so this fails so we'll pull a shark tank here. I'm sorry. On this theory, I'm out. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we're getting through this, and what we're going to do is split out now uh, for a second part uh, to continue this. Uh, we'll go ahead and release it right away uh, in the next 24 hours. Uh, so you have both of these videos and you can watch it all the way through. Uh, just got too long and it needed to be a second video. But this is so important. Uh, one of the major things uh, that we have really spent 
uh, a lot of focus and time on on this channel is restoring ancient geography. Now I know modern scholars they, they don't even care about it. I mean they just don't. Just look at the KJV, look at the maps in there. They're ridiculous. They're laughable. They're so bad, especially on ancient geography. And yet we've had sources like Jubilees, which maps the Earth, the oldest map of the Earth, a, a pretty good one, comprehensive one. You have First Enoch, which has a map of a good portion of the Earth, not all of it, but a good portion, uh, and also the cosmology of the Earth, and all kinds of things that we don't even know. And yet these are the basis for Scripture and for prophecy. We don't understand prophecy because we don't understand these things. And then we get into disciplines like, oh, well, DNA proves. DNA doesn't prove anything unless you know how to interpret it. And if you don't know migration patterns, then you're not a DNA scientist. You don't know what you even just saw. And they've screwed up all of this stuff because the synagogue of Satan operates all of these things and it's on purpose, folks. So we can get beyond that. This knowledge is important. You know, being in relationship with him is what matters. That's salvation. It's a relationship, right? And ultimately, you know, learning and growing is how we foster that relationship. So all of these things are important. And again, we'll never understand even prophecy in the New Testament without these things. We have over 550 videos on YouTube with alternative platforms in the description box. Please remember to like, subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. But since YouTube seems to be broken at times, at least for our channel anyway, uh, join our email list uh, on our website. Just go to thegodculture.com. Enter your email in the pop-up and we'll notify you ourselves. We have published 10 books now in three years with more to come. You can download free an ebook at ophirinstitute.com or purchase and print internationally, but our content is free. Uh, all links are there. Also, we have created a 26 or 52 week series supporting each book, further testing and explaining them. So uh, that's all there. Our Instagram was hacked, but now back up and we, uh, so check it out. We also started a TikTok account recently, but no, nope, ain't gonna see no dance in there. Sorry. Uh, we will also be appearing on Zen Garcia's show in the U.S. somewhat regularly now, uh, at least for a while. And back to the Philippines, we are always mindful of our viewers here creating videos and now books in Tagalog, including Filipino language, uh, including Solomon's Treasure, uh, and our net, which will be coming out in print soon. Uh, but already available free in ebook uh, at ophirinstitute.com. Uh, next book coming very soon in Tagalog. We're working on it now, wrapping it up uh, in the Filipino language. Uh, we have like 70 plus videos in Tagalog now as well. Uh, again, all books free in ebook at ophirinstitute.com. Uh, if you are Filipino, watch our viral Solomon's Gold series. If you haven't, it'll change your life life and perspective. Uh, it's in English or Tagalog uh, for many of the videos. We are working on Solomon's Treasure in Ilocano right now as well, and we're looking for other dialects too because uh, we want to break that down for everyone as well as we can. Uh, and we have some really big projects working right now. Can't wait to get them far enough along to tell you about all of them. Uh, we love you guys, and we are glad you are here. Always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.
about 382 AD, in the days of Jerome, known for the Latin Vulgate, a new term began to circulate in Bible scholarship, according to R.H. Charles. Certain texts of historical value, and even canon, were now labeled as something other than inspired scripture. The very concept is a clear redefining of books already in existence, and in most cases, text recorded as inspired scripture and Bible canon now somehow in question by those without any such authority. This paradigm remains today even further rooted as if it ever represented the historical approach to these Old Testament texts as some vet as truth. How do these texts stand up to the Torah test? The answer on many of these books will likely shock especially scholars who have never actually conducted such research, which becomes evident. It's not in their paradigm. This canon was already chosen before there were Pharisees in Jerusalem and before there was ever a Catholic church. Those factions do not get to legitimately form councils to vote on that, which was already settled, fact, long before, even in archaeology. You are entering a zone for truth with our new Apocrypha Test series. Follow along, and together we will dispel the myths of modern scholarship. And man, are they profoundly lacking in intellect on this topic, you will see. Not anymore. Download your copies of Volume 1 and Volume 2 of our Comprehensive Apocrypha Research free in ebook today or get your copies at apocryphatest.com. All links are there. We now begin.